The, the thing that's intrigued me is that it, it's it's absolutely clear the, the love of rhythm and blues and the big hitters like you've mentioned, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Larry Williams. Yet their first album has got four covers on and there's kind of more of a kind of a do-what feel of it. And, and the great thing is three of them are female artists. Yes, well, yeah. a big thing happens. Black, black female artists. Absolutely. A big thing happens in 1961, 62. Because the Beatles' taste is ever evolving, they 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 banked what they liked and they never forgot it. But they didn't stop there, so they didn't get stuck with Elvis. They loved Elvis, and they, he was their always their number one hero. But they didn't only listen to Elvis, and they were they continually had their ears tuned to what was new. And what was new in '61 was this great sound coming out of a, a New York, which was the Gold Group sound. Um. The first great breakthrough being Will You Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelles. And yeah. once they got into the gold group sound, then there were lots of other groups to discover. Um, the Cookies doing um, uh, Chains. Chains? Chains, yeah. yeah. Um, that was or the Cookies, as they say, because they were from Liverpool. <laughs> they didn't say Cookies, the Cookies. Um, <laughs> the Cookies. Chains! great thing about um, the girl group sound was that it was an East Coast sound and it was it was the brilliant coming together of two lots of racially abused people which is Jewish people and black people because they both suffered racism forever and still do to this day and um, typically will be Jewish songwriters like Goffin and King or Lieber and Stoller or Doc Pomerson and Mort Schumann um, and record companies uh, like um, Scepter, which the Shirelles were on, which was um, Florence Greenberg, that was her record label, and black talent like Luther Dixon, who would write some of the songs that they loved. He wrote Boys, that was a Luther Dixon song. I've been told when a boy kisses a girl, she takes a trip around. And the singers were typically girls from American schools. Like the Shirelles were from, they were all at school together. And all this comes out of the church, this this boys or girls singing together. I mean, the influence of the black black churches, gospel, gospel music on R&B is immense. And it's still filtering through. So when you get to this album, the Beatles are into their girl group sound. This is an original copy of Please Please Me from 63. And what are they doing on here? They're doing um, Chains, um, which was the Kookies. That was Goffin and King. They're doing Boys, which was, was the Shirelles. That's Luther Dixon. Um, they're doing Baby It's You, which is uh, another pair of Jewish songwriters, Bacharach and David. Um, that was for the Shirelles. Um, they're doing... Um, Anna, go to him. Anna, you come and ask me, girl, to set you free, girl. You say he loves you more than me. Well, I will set you free. Go with him. Go with him. When they get to the second album, this piece of deliciosity 
with the Beatles. Mm. Um, then their, their music has evolved again because during the course of 63, they got more and more and more heavily into what was coming out on Tamla, mm. Tamla yeah. Motown. Except in Britain, that label didn't exist yet and the Tamla sounds were coming out on the likes of um, Oriole and Fontana. That's how you would get the Motown records. Motown yeah. didn't yet exist as a record label in Britain, not till I think 60... I trying to remember, was it 63? Five. I'll stand correct. I'll get that right in volume two. But anyway, um, so on this one they're doing um, "Please, Mr. Postman." That's the Marvelettes. Yeah. Um, you really got a hold on me, which was Smokey Robinson. The Miracles. It was actually not Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. It was just the Miracles. But it's Smokey. It's his song, and he's singing it. Heart is a, a little obscure group called the Donnays, or I think it's Donnays, yeah. might be Donnays, Donnays, uh, and Money, um, which is the closing track on this album, um, which had been done by Barrett Strong. That was one of the first Tamla Motown records. Yeah. Um, they closed this album with Twist and Shout by the Isley Brothers, right. um, yeah. and they closed this album with Money by Barrett Strong. and. Arguably, and I would be, I would argue this, they actually eclipsed the originals with their cover versions. Mm. Because as brilliant as those originals are, as, as authentic as they are, you can't get more authentic than that. There was something about the way the beat was covered that was just, they would, they would kind of slightly rearrange um, and they would make it so exciting. The best things in life are free, but you can get So yeah, Mark, on the John Lennon shoebox um, that was on the South Bank show many years ago, uh, the Isley Brothers uh, talk about the screaming uh, that they said the Beatles uh, imitated. Um, can you go into that a little bit? And Little Richard was another reason that they screamed as well. They particularly loved yeah, the way yeah. that I mean, Paul would do Little Richard almost as good as Little Richard. I mean, one of Paul's friends at um, the Institute, Ian James, uh, who taught Paul the guitar. And within about a week, Paul had kind of whizzed past him in, in ability because that was Paul. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Ian, Ian James said that little Richard's voice would bubble out of Paul. It would erupt out of him in the middle of anything, a, a given moment, any given <laughs> moment. And suddenly little Rick Paul would go, Woo! you know, because I mean, that, that's, yeah. yeah. They were just, they just loved these people. And and the great thing about the Beatles was that they never claimed anything falsely. They would always say where they got things from. And one of the reasons that we have such knowledge of their influences is because they were so open in, in expressing their admiration for where they got things from. Um, and even that extended to when they nicked things. Like, um, we know that the baseline in... Uh, the Beatles I saw are standing there is the same bass line as Chuck Berry's. Is it you can't catch? Uh, talking about you, it is talking about you, yeah, because yeah. because Paul said it in '64 yeah. in an interview in um, Beat Instrumental magazine. This is like that's where I nicked yeah. it from. He says. So um, they were very <laughs> open in in everything, and that yeah. in uh, is not only a very endearing trait, but also brilliant for those who wish to study where they got things mm. from. You know?
also on uh, John Lennon's shoebox. Bobby Parker is featured, um, and he, you know he, he was flattered that the Beatles um, almost copied, um, interpreted it, one of his guitar licks. But isn't it a case of that Bobby Parker would have got that from someone else, Dizzy Gillespie or whatever, and it, in the blues everything was passed on. In reality, I mean, if you really dig into your into music history, you can find where Chuck Berry got his sound from. You know, and yeah. you you can find where Carl Perkins got his sound from, and to these to the Beatles, yeah. these guys were the originals. But but what in life is is certainly in terms of creative art is ever truly original. I mean, the best creative art is where you take, you absorb the things that inspire you, and then you you turn yeah. them into something new and fresh. It's but it's still got right. bits of yeah. something else. It's still got ingredients, but you just baked it differently and added something of your own. And you and you've got yeah. new art, and um, I was irritated in that John Lennon Jukebox think, thing because they made like Charles in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they love doing some other guy by Richie Barrett. Yeah, um, that was a big, yeah. big song for the Beatles. Um, but really, they they used to call it "Son of What Did I Say" because it, I mean, you wouldn't have yeah. you wouldn't have some other guy if you hadn't have had "What Did I Say" first. You know, I mean. It leans quite heavily on it. It's still a great track in its own right, but it, it leans heavily on it. When you see me in misery, come on, baby, see about me now. In that, in that John Lennon South Bank show about his jukebox, I got a bit irritated. Because the director seemed to be trying to make Bobby Parker say that he should have had a royalty because he had been ripped off, and yeah, he didn't look comfortable. Yeah. In the end, eventually they pressed him enough, and he said it, and they, of course the director used it, but he didn't look comfortable saying it because it wasn't really what he thought. No. And besides, they it was three mm. notes. It was just three notes. And why do we know this? Because yeah. John Lennon went on radio in New York in 1974 and said. Bobby Park, let's let's listen to because he was with the DJ putting on whatever records they like. Let's listen to Bobby Parker's "Watch Your Step." Yeah. We had, that was yeah. part of what led to "I Feel Fine." Great, you know that's absolutely yeah. fine. We wouldn't be talking yeah. about Bobby Parker if they hadn't done that. By the time we get to, by the time we get to Beatles for Sale and Long Tall Sally, they've gone further back again, haven't they? In terms of the, the, the covers they've done on there, they've gone back to the probably the big three: Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Larry Williams. Is, was that the pressure of just touring and recording, and and making films? I don't know. I mean, I guess if they had had enough, well, sentimental, and they're still only twenty three. If, if they'd had enough originals, they maybe wouldn't have done the covers that they did do. But um, it always makes me laugh, actually, because people say, because the first album had cover versions on it, and the second album had cover versions on it, and the third one, A Hard Day's Night, didn't. People look down on this, the fourth one, because it's got cover versions on it. And it's just like, oh, well, they must have run out of originals or whatever. It was their fourth album that three of them had covers on. So with hindsight, it looks yeah. like they, they run out of ideas, but maybe they just wanted to do the covers. The question you're asking is, why did they choose these covers? And I'm not in, exactly sure, but they do go back. You're quite right. They do rock and roll music, which is Chuck Berry. They do Mr. Moonlight, which was um, Dr. Feelgood, a real obscure record, Dr. Feelgood and the interns. Little Richard, Kansas City. That was Paul singing that, of course. Um, Buddy Holly, it's the only Buddy Holly song they did in their main catalogue for EMI, Words of Love, Carl Perkins, two numbers on here, Honey Don't, and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, 
Um, I may have missed one, but I think there's six covers on here in total and eight originals. And they do, they do all go back, you're quite right, to that 50s period. I'm not quite sure why they chose I'm, those songs. I was, yeah, I was wondering if maybe they're more familiar with them or they're just getting more affection for them because of the distance from that time, maybe four or five years. But there's a gem missing from it, isn't it, that was left off for Mr. Moonlight? Uh, Leave My Kitten Alone um, is, yeah. is the outtake from that album, the, the track they recorded but didn't issue. We do now have it. It's on the anthology. And that's um, Little Willie John. Um, so, yeah, that that's one. This one, this has got Long Tall Sally on it. Larry Williams is Slow Down and Carl Perkins' Matchbox. When we talked about Twist and Shout earlier, this is, this is a huge record in 1963, the Twist and Shout EP. Uh, and, of mm. course, it's all the songs they did on the BBC that we now have on the two BBC compilation albums. Mm. You know, they did a great many um, tracks that have been formative for them, but that they weren't going to be putting down on record at Abbey Road, but they did them in the BBC studio. And thankfully, we have the tapes. Mm. And uh, their repertoire was extraordinarily broad. Uh, and but it it knew no it knew no boundaries you know I mean a good song was a good song was a good song and partly because they'd grown up in the pre rock and roll era they weren't prejudiced against anything that came before it so um, it was fair game for them for them to do any kind of Broadway show tunes or anything that was a good song. You better leave. For songs like um, Devil in His Heart, Devil in Her Heart, um, isn't it a case of that they were just looking for most obscure tracks they could find? Uh, and then they take that to other members of the group and say, oh, well, you found it, you can sing it. Yes, I think they, they would instantly grab songs when they were in the booth, either together or, or, or in pairs or singly or whatever. They, they would grab, I want to do this one. And, and things did yeah. fall into certain lines. John typically would do the Chuck Berry songs and Paul typically would do the Little Richard songs. But when you've got single tracks like the Donnays or the Marvelettes or, or anything like that, then I, I think it, it might be just whoever bagged it, you know? I mean, whoever whoever had, yeah. had the greater passion or said, I want to do it, I want to do it. I mean, they're just, yeah, just yeah. They're kids in a booth, you know? I mean, this, we're not talking about yeah. a precise science here. It's who shouts louder or who kicks someone else in the shin and says, no, I'll do it. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we're talking about enthusiasts and the Beatles were great music enthusiasts. And, and what you have on all these EMI and, and BBC recordings is an enthusiasm to, um, to revel in something that they really enjoy, you know, and, and, Part of the reason that they went for the obscure was because in Liverpool there was this competition of there being other groups as well as the Beatles, you know. So yeah. there might be four, five, six, up to 10, 12 acts even on a bill one night, like the big shows that Sam Leach put on at New Brighton Tower. There would be like 12 acts on one show um, or, you know, whatever number, five, six, seven acts. And um, they'd be in their dressing room and they'd be hearing... You know, they, they, they've got what they're going to do written out on a piece of paper and then they hear Jerry and the Pacemakers doing it or they hear yeah. King Size Taylor doing it or whatever and cross that off, cross that off. Yeah. So they were determined to come up with a, a, a repertoire that was unique to them that other people wouldn't know. Mm. They would hear the Beatles do it, but then they couldn't really do it because the Beatles were doing it. Um, there were mm. a few songs that did get done by more than one group, but the Beatles typically, their desire to be different led to them hunting out the particularly obscure tracks. And because they yeah. were professional and didn't have day jobs, they could hang out all afternoon in NEMS listening to everything. Whereas if you had a day job, you really didn't have the time to do that. So they could dive a lot deeper as a result of that. He's got the devil in his heart.
you mentioned something earlier about um, when the Beatles went to America. They um, and I just want to pick up on that because they. The great thing was that the, the, the Americans loved the Beatles partly because they were British, they were English, um, and they were different, and they were novel to it, novelty in a sense to anything they had seen before. But the Beatles were projecting either Black American music back into America, or their own music, their own Lennon and McCartney songs, which were so heavily Black influenced. And so, mm. in a sense, they were turning a mirror to American kids, to American music that they may well have missed. And and yeah. that is a crucial part of their breakthrough in America because everybody was asking them, what music do you listen to? And they would always say, black music. We're listening to mm. stuff on uh, Motown from Detroit. Yeah. And um, this was a phenomenal fillip to... Barry Gordy at the Motown record label because suddenly they were in the spotlight second hand, if you like. I mean, yeah. the, the biggest act of all are saying, we like this stuff. And so everyone's looking or listening to that stuff now. And also financially, um, Barry Gordy didn't only have Motown, Tamla, Motown Records. He had Joe Beat uh, Music, which was the publishing arm. And most yeah. of the songs, I don't know about the percent, what percentage it was, but it seems to me that most of the key original songs on Motown were published by Joe B. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And yeah. um, so Mot the Motown organization will get like three tenths of the publishing on those early Beatles albums in America. Yeah. And that they were selling by millions. I mean, Meet the Beatles sold yeah, four, yeah. four million before the year was out. Four million copies of one album. They're on three tenths of the publishing of that. This was a vast, vast injection mm. of funds into the Motown organization that came about directly because of the Beatles. They were presumably listening to American radio by now, were they? Is that where those have come from, or is it just a continuation? Yeah, when the Beatles first go to America, they one of the things that they are consumed by is radio, because they're familiar with the BBC and Radio Luxembourg, and pretty much that's it. Um, but American radio was way more freeform, uh, particularly in the metropolitan areas like New York, where Murray the K on 1010 Winds would be playing the good records and it didn't matter who who the artist was and what skin color they had. I mean, a lot of American radio was segregated, um, but in the metropolitan areas, particularly in New York, it wasn't. And they got into a lot of music through being in America. And in a sense, that helped shape their taste as well. So when they get back from the States, they're making a hard day's night. And on the set of A Hard Day's Night, a journalist comes along from Disc, Disc Weekly, as it was known then. This is an issue from uh, May the 9th, 1964. And on the back cover is a feature called It's the Beatles' Choice, where a journalist, yeah. I think it was a guy called Alan Walsh, a Liverpool guy, actually, um, asked them to name their favourite records of the moment. And you get incredible insight into what it was they were listening to. Um, Ringo, for example, everything was black. <laughs> Ringo's I Got a Woman by Jimmy McGriff, What Kind of Fool by The Tams, It's All Right by The Impressions, uh, Monkey Time by Major Lance, uh, Love is Blind by Irma Franklin, uh, and Um 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 by Major Lance. John says anything by Major Lance is okay by me. So the Beatles had this yeah. thing where they would infuse collectively so if one likes something, they all tended to like it as well. And they had this shared, whether it might be an item of clothing or a hairstyle or a moustache or a record, they would all get into it at the same time. Um, Mary Wells, says John, two lovers. Well, Mary Wells, pretty much as a result of this, was invited by the Beatles to be on their British tour in 1964. She was the first 
Motown artist to do a, a British tour because the Beatles put her on the tour. Technicality, mm-hmm. she wasn't quite on Motown when she came because she had left by then and gone to 20th Century Fox. But nonetheless, she was, in their eyes, a Motown artist. Um, Who's Loving You by The Miracles? Please, please, please by James Brown. This is John. Paul's into James Ray still, if you've got to make a fool of somebody. Ray Charles, Little Richard, Marvin Gaye, Chuck Jackson. He was a big influence mm. on the Beatles, Chuck Jackson. And George says Daddy Rolling Stone by Derek Martin. Uh, on the American Sioux label, the voice is great, so is the female backing. I particularly like the rhythm, he says. So that's a few months before uh, I feel fine. Uh, Walk on by, High Heel Sneakers by, to- by Tommy Tucker. They love that. Uh, more Mary Wells, Marvin Gaye, and so on and so on and so on. So their taste evolved, you know. I mean, they did love Elvis and they did love Chuck and they did love Carl and they did love Little Richard but, and Arthur Alexander, but, but they sure loved Marvin Gaye and, and, and um, Otis Redding. Well, I've got two lovers and I ain't ashamed. absolutely loved a whole range of music and, and were completely smitten by Motown and yet Motown appeared to repeat the, the trick and, and appeared to be smitten by the Beatles. Was that commercial or was that love? I think it was love. I think it was a two-way love affair, Motown, got, Motown and the Beatles. Yeah. Um, no, I think it was genuine. We've got, we've got that album, yeah, we've got that album by the Supremes, A Little Bit of Liverpool uh, and a terrific version of by the Supremes of You Can't Do That. Yes. Which, of course, John said was inspired by Wilson Pickett. So it's yeah. Black America, Paul coming back to America again. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I think it was real because the thing about the, uh, so many things about the Beatles that made them great, one of them is that they wrote amazingly brilliant songs. The Lennon McCartney song catalogue was the greatest popular song catalogue of, of the 20th century. I'm going to put my neck out and say yeah. that. And um, a good song is a good song is a good song. And in a sense, adult America, which looked down its nose on the Beatles when they arrived in 64, um, got into them through the appreciation by American artists, respectful, respected American artists of Beatles songs. So when Count Basie did, I think he did two Beatles albums in the end, Count Basie, uh, it was just like, oh, well, these songs do have something then. I mean, Duke Ellington did Beatles songs. Um, Mm. So it was Ella Fitzgerald did a Beatles song, or more than one. Um, So suddenly it's like, yeah, actually they do have something. And that was because the songs were brilliant. And Lennon McCartney songs proved themselves adaptable to almost, well, in fact, scrub almost, to all formats of music uh, and and, um, came across well. So um, I think when Motown covered the Beatles, there is actually an album called Motown Sings the Beatles, which gathers together. I mean, Stevie Wonder's We Can Work It Out is a fantastic track. Um, it gathers mm. together all these all these hits, and uh, it's a good album because they're great artists doing great songs. Try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go on? I see it your way on the risk of knowing saying you can get it wrong and still think that it's all right think of what i'm saying we can work it out and get it straight or say good night we can work it out we can work it out it's almost like the the ultimate compliment to black artists who they revere and respect covering their music which has its roots in, in rhythm and blues 
Do you have a favourite at all? Oh, wow. Um, Esther Phillips and I love him. I'll, I'll just name a few because it's hard to name one. Al Green did a great version of I Want to Hold Your Hand, which I'm very partial to. Paul mm. had the honour of having Ray Charles do Eleanor Rigby. I mean, this is the kid in a council house in Allerton listening to What Did I Say? Seven years later, Ray Charles is doing his song, mm. Eleanor Rigby. Um, what else? Um, Something by Isaac Hayes, which is 12 minutes. That's an extraordinary oh, piece. James Brown's cover of Something was George's favourite. Um, I love Otis Redding doing Day Tripper. That is superb. Mm. Um, and Roy Redman doing Good Day Sunshine. That's one that Paul heard in the clubs in the 60s, probably in the Scottish St. James in London, and decided that that was his favourite. Peter, do you have one? Oh, it's very difficult to answer what, what your favourite uh, uh, Beatles cover is, really. But I'd have to go for um, Ray Charles, Long and Winding Road. And the reason I've chosen that, really, is because when Paul McCartney was writing it in, um, in, in his farmhouse in Scotland, uh, he had Ray Charles in mind when he wrote the uh, lyrics and the song itself. So for Ray Charles to cover that, you know, it's it's the uh, it's the perfect uh, compliment. The long and winding road. Had that lead to your door. I, I always loved Stevie Wonder's version of We Can Work It Out. And in fact, I think I was more familiar with that as a kid than I was with the Beatles. And I loved the way he, he it felt psychedelic because of the phasing on the guitars, but I loved the way he changed. Instead of We Can Work It Out, it's We Can Work It Out. You know, it becomes more of a play. So I've always loved that. And, and there's a couple of versions of Here Comes the Sun. Um, there's Richie Haven's version. Yeah, which is from Woodstock. But I, I think the one I, I love the most is probably Nina Simone's version, which has got that longing and that pain. Um, but, you know, we, we could have a whole show about this alone. But it, it's fascinating that these artists that they revered so much paid them the ultimate compliment, really, which is to, to do some of their songs. Here comes the sun, little darling. Here comes the sun, I say. It's all right. It's all right. Here comes the sun, little darling. Here comes the sun. I say it's all right. It's all right. We're running a little bit out of time, but. It, have we got time just to talk about the solo rock and roll albums of John and Paul? Because again, it's like a reaffirmation of this is this is where we come from. Strange recording history, nineteen seventy-three, four. But it, essentially, yes, it's John wanting to get away for once from having to write. Every, you know, everything was first person or from personal experience, and bearing his soul or his thoughts or his fears, whatever it might be, in a song much easier just to go in and do rock and roll and he went in with phil specter and the sessions kind of fell apart but nonetheless <clears throat> some people look down on this album and i don't know why i think it's brilliant i always have and i love i mean his stand by me which he used to do in the cavern with the Beatles, yeah. the benny king stand by me that is just sublime he does some little richard on his slipping and sliding and ready teddy rip it up it's that's that's a good album for me I'm very happy with that. I'm glad he did it. 
and uh, great cover too. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. No, I won't be afraid. Oh, I won't be afraid just as long as you stand, stand by me. So darling, darling, stand. And, and, and there's a kind of the sort of link between Come Together and Catch Me If You Can. Chuck Berry led to some, some of the inclusions on there, I think, didn't it? Well, yeah, because um, there's a line, a couple of lines in uh, Come Together that he, he borrowed from Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me, which I'm sure Chuck would have been fine about, but Chuck probably got them from somewhere else. Um, I mean, I'm, I, don't, <laughs> I don't actually mean that, but, you know, borrowing was in the wind. Um, but yeah. the, the publisher got heavy, and in a sense, this album came about because John was forced to record three songs in that publishing catalog um, as part of his yeah. uh, uh, um, punishment, if you like, or the penalty for, for, for lick, yeah. nicking <laughs> those lines. Um, Paul, yeah. Paul did a couple of albums, didn't he? This is one of them, the Russian album, so-called, oh, right. um, which is him in 1987 going into Abbey Road with a, a bunch of musicians and trying to put down you can see their names there. I'm sure you can all read that. Yeah. See, very well known names there doing playing on this album. Um, one just again, it's that thing of they're just rockers at heart, really. You know, I mean, mm. no matter what music we all hear in our lives, what we hear at the ages of 14 to 16 or 14 to 18 is really at our core. And so, no matter that. You know, they've done all, they've had, you know, Paul's now been recording music for almost 60 years. I dare say, I'm not privy to it anymore, but I dare say that when he goes in the studio and he wants to jam for a bit or warm up or whatever it might be, that one of these old songs will be what comes to his mind, whether it's Lucille or 20 Flight mm. Rock or whatever it might be. It's it's part of who he is, you know, it's in the DNA. Yeah. And then there was this one which he did in the immediate aftermath of Linda's death in 1998. Probably, again, a cathartic experience. Um, so what's on there? Blue Jean Bop. And she said, yeah, that's Larry Williams. All shook up, of course. Elvis. And a few mm. of his own songs as well. But there's some, there's some good songs on there. Um, it's, just, it's just who they are, isn't it? This, the, you know, if it wasn't for... You know, these rock and roll artists in the 50s, and they were the true pioneers, um, then we wouldn't have any of this, you know, because they were the spark that lit the fire. You made me cry when you said goodbye. Is that a shame? My tears feel like rain. Just, just one last thing, Mark. Um, do you think um, black music influence on the Beatles is recognised enough in the narrative when you when you come to places like Liverpool? It's 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 hard because it's it's kind of deep knowledge in a sense. I mean, the, it's remarkable yeah. that. 50 now coming up 60 years on that the Beatles are still being talked about at all. They utterly deserve it. And I think it's, it yeah. seems clear to me that it's going to last a lot longer than it, it already has. But people knowing them is one thing. People knowing who influenced them or what their origins were is something else. Again, that is the kind of knowledge that really only comes with the those who are inquisitive enough to find out to read a book like tune in yeah. or to check on the internet, whatever it might be. Um, so I don't know whether it's appreciated enough, but um, it, it's, it's awful to think that um, there might still be any kind of prejudice against any of these artists 
and the work that they did that was so important um, or just prejudice I mean there's yeah. you know, I mean, it's scary how much prejudice there is again these days and um, yeah the Beatles were all about breaking down prejudices and breaking down labels. I mean, we've been talking about yeah. R&B a lot in this conversation. They didn't even really call it R&B because they didn't want to hang a tag on things. Because the moment you hang mm. a tag on something, then you've almost kind of defined it, shaped it, put it in a box, and this is either inside the box or it's outside the box. Their whole yeah. mentality, collective mentality, was to not think like that. And I think that's a very important right. thing to consider yeah. about the Beatles because that was yeah. the best way. And that's, that's a lovely way to think about it and finish as, as well. So I, th I think ju just hearing you talk and, and great questions from Peter has given us great confidence to carry these stories with us and encourage them to be heard in the city. Um, and just like to say thank you so much, Mark, for your time. Thank you for your time as well, Peter, and the brilliant questions. Um, this is on the record, on record in conversation and I'd like to thank Paul McMullen who's done all the tech behind the scenes. Um, big thanks also to Culture Liverpool who funded this, Liverpool, Liverpool City Region Music Board who've got behind it and special thanks to Yao Awusu who's come up with the idea. I hope we can do this again next year. Thanks very much folks. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Brilliant. Lovely. Okay. You wanna take me home with you tonight baby? Take me home, yeah. Amen. <laughs>